Kevin helped me a little bit because I realized if I yell eloquently, I might be able to get you to leave in my illusory superiority. The, um, and actually, I, I love that talk because everybody believes in what they do. Um, and I started out with my kind of my standard set of slides for this talk, and then I changed it today after we all met for breakfast. Uh, because I did want to just kind of uh, get people a little bit more agitated about this because I bring it up and it's kind of stale. It's how you close the bone and people have been doing it the same way forever. And uh, it reminds me of um, Tom Fogarty saying that if you've been doing something the same way for 30 years, chances are you're doing it wrong. So uh, with that, what do I <laughs> click here to move this one? So I just grabbed this this morning, actually, Dan was kind enough to help me with my slides. I'm a terrible slide maker, so my slides are not very pretty, uh, but uh, we fabricated this this morning. And I, I, my first disclaimer is that I love TAVR. I love doing TAVR. I think it's great technology. It has changed the direction of care for so many people, but we have to keep in mind that surgical aortic valve replacement does have a phenomenal history. There are places we can improve there. But so when we look at this, how, why is TAVR walloping SAVR? Why is the cost so much better in intermediates? Because during the follow-up time, these patients are not sitting around in rehab centers and they're not having those complications that go along with that. So the other $9,300 comes on the tail end of the deal when they go to an extended care facility, when they get a pneumonia, when they bounce back into the emergency room. So this is what we have to go after. And, and if we're gonna go after this, if we're gonna change the way that people are managed after they have an operation, uh, you know, as scientists, we want to make one change, we want to track it, we want to know what the impact of that one change is. We will never get anywhere with this. As was mentioned earlier, um, that there are the, there's this concept of marginal changes, that small incremental differences in what we do can become a composite, have a composite impact on our overall outcome. And we have to make judgment calls and then we have to put things together and see where we end up. So uh, again, I made some of these slides this morning, but pain, strength, mobility, home, and satisfaction. So we have to make pain go away because tavers don't hurt and there are other things that people can have where they don't have any pain and people come to my office and they tell me they don't wanna have any pain and we have to give them their strength back. They have to be up and mobile, even with prehab, after the surgery, we don't wanna take all the wind out of their sails. We wanna give them their strength back. They have to have their mobility. Old people are deathly afraid of not having their mobility. They wanna get out of bed on their own. They wanna get on and off the toilet on their own. They don't wanna lose all their dignity in the process of having heart surgery. It becomes more and more important the older they are because they don't see that last several years of their lives as so important that they're willing to give up all of these things in order to have them. So they have to be satisfied. So aortic valve replacement, what do we do? We go to a parasternal approach. It's great, minimal pain, patients can go right home. Mitral and tricuspid surgery, we go to many thoracotomy, do cryo block, we get rid of their pain. Everything else goes through a sternotomy. And a sternotomy is still a great way to do an operation. There's so much we can do through a sternotomy. And in fact, if you're gonna do an aortic valve, and just an aortic valve, and you're gonna do a sternotomy, that's fine, but you should think about the consequences of the sternotomy. I'm gonna jump right into what our pain management protocol is, because we got here with multiple changes in what we do all of a sudden. Uh, and this is our pain management protocol. We don't use opiates at all. The, the only people that get off of those guardrails, and I actually have two of my PAs here, um, Amanda and Chrissy, who can call bullshit if I say anything that's not actual, that's not real. The only time we go off of those guardrails is when people that were on opiates at home before uh, or, and are addicted to them and occasionally in kind of a more robust muscular young man who really has a lot of muscle pain, a lot of pain, and it usually doesn't have the negative impact that we see in some of the older frailer people. So, and we just piled it all on. Did the, liter did the literature search, what do you think about lidocaine? Well, it might work, it's cheap, it's not a big deal, we're gonna do the lidocaine. Ketamine in the operating room, IV acetaminophen, I had to beg for it for 48 hours of a IV acetaminophen. Um, and we use that for 48 hours. And then we go to Presidex after surgery, we'll use a little Lyrica in the intensive care unit, and then that's it, they don't get anything else. They don't get any opiates when they get out. So no Norcos, none of the other stuff. Uh, for valves, a little bit different because we can loosen up and use the Toradol, we use Celebrex, et cetera. We just kind of watch the renal function, make sure everything's okay. And then uh, at the bottom there, you'll see call MD for any uncontrolled pain greater than two hours after the protocol. So 
once in a while we take a phone call and then we deal with it. And I demand that we get called because I don't want people to hurt. There's no reason for them to hurt. We can make them comfortable and we don't have to use those drugs. Part of this, though, is eliminating the pain of the sternotomy. So there's a long history of how we manage osteotomies, right? For 30 years, people have been putting bones together using screws and, and plates and, and uh, rods. Uh, and osteotomies hurt and bones protect. So these things have to be reconstituted to as near normal function as possible to put the human being, to put the organism back in full function. So all the true except for sternotomy. So forever, you can see we're on the bottom line there. We have not succumbed to the allure of putting a bone back together the way that everybody else does. Suture wires remain the primary method of closure. Why? Because surgeons don't think they have complications. Every time you ask a surgeon, they say they don't have any complications. And you know what? I'm going to say that that's not true, but I'm also going to say I don't care. I'm going to kind of look at everything else in this conversation about that. Low cost, of course, is cheap. So going back to 2012, so six years ago, this gets published. Sternal closure with rigid plate fixation versus wire closure, a randomized control multicenter trial. So this is the first randomized control, I think there was one other, uh, multicenter trial looking at this, at rigid fixation. And I point this out because if you look at the totality of heart surgery, I, I want somebody to tell me four randomized control studies that were positive in heart surgery. There's nobody in here who can do it, because I can't think of them. I can't think of them. There's three I can think of, but four is hard. It's a tough call. They were positive. They had a positive outcome that you were going to do something different because it showed you that it did a better job. So this is what it looked at. It looked at bone healing. And, and I put underneath there, tell me what you want. So I want people to pause for a second and think, if I had a sternotomy, my bone was split in half, do I want surclage, which is wires that wrap around my bone, or do I want someone to put, use little thin plates and screws and put my bone back together so it doesn't move anymore? It's a pretty easy answer, really. So they were looking at, back then, of course, they were looking at primary endpoint for significant bone healing and happened at six months. Everything was positive. So a sternal lock blue study comes along, and this is the next randomized control study. It has 236 patients, and I always get pushback, but there's only 236 patients in this study. And I say, who cares? It's a randomized control study. It proves its point based on the numbers that it has, and if it's true, it's true. If it's not true, it's not true, right? I mean, significance is all we need. So the, new, the, the significance was achieved in this study. I'm not going to belabor it too much. They look at the bone at five different places. It's, it's designed a priori. It's blinded for the, the radiologists who look at it. They show that there's better bone healing. Now, one of the really important things about this study, because I'll talk loosely about some other studies that were done retrospectively, is that in this prospective randomized study, the inclusion criteria uh, were for patients that are in the middle of the road. So these are not the high-risk patients. Sometimes I talk to surgeons, they say, well, I just do high-risk patients. Well, you don't have much data for that. We have a lot of data for our average patient, which is why in our, pro in our program we plate everybody, because we can't figure out who it is that's going to get into trouble, and we certainly don't know who to deny the comfort of having their sternum rigidly plated. But so these are middle-of-the-road patients, and they are kind of your basic cocktail of heart surgery patients, uh, a little bit heavy, they all have high blood pressure, a fair amount of vascular disease, et cetera, but they don't have severe pulmonary disease, they don't have BMIs over 40, and um, they're, again, kind of a standard cross-section. So what happens? CT scan scores are better for the patients who are plated, they heal more, and I think the significance of this isn't just that the bone is healing, because we're not deciding to live liberalize their, their activity based on the bone healing. We're deciding based on bone healing being, being an indicator of stability. In other words, how stable is the bone? It's so stable that the bone heals quickly. So that allows us to be a little bit more liberal with how we manage these patients. It's what we do anyway. So definition of external complications, you know, the STS looks at 30 days. This is looked at six months. Deep sternal wound infections were more in the patients who had wire surclage than they were in the ones with rigid sternal fixation. But again, you know, I'm not even going to focus on that. It's important because those, those infections cost a lot of money and they're, they're devastating for patients. As you know, a sternectomy is one of the worst things you can do to a human being. You take out their sternum, they're never the same again. But again, I'm going to move along here. Uh, they do show that readmissions and complications are more. There's more hospital stays, readmissions for the people, people with wire surclage. And then this, perhaps more germane to what I'm talking about paper, was just published. Um, and you can see Keith Allen is the, chief, the lead author on all of these. He was the PI for the national study and did an incredible job. 
Uh, and this study then kind of focuses more on those other consequences for the patients. Are they having pain? Are they miserable? Are they in extended care facilities? And what's the impact of that? And just now, this is a randomized study, so these patients don't know if they have plates or not. Nobody treats them differently based on whether they have plates or not. We treat patients differently based on their plates, but in, not in this study. That's not what's happening. But still, there's 237 total fewer days in rehab for the patients who have sternal plating than the patients who do not. Uh, which line do you want to be on? You always want to be on the blue one because there's less pain. Uh, quality of life, better. Which line do you want to be on? The higher quality of life, better. Upper extremity functional indices. So these are looking at how the well they could use their upper extremities without telling them that they're allowed to use their upper extremities differently than you could before. So they're being treated, everybody's being instructed the same way. But still, the patients with plates feel like their functional index is better for their upper extremities. Fewer sternal complications with rigid fixation. We have to come back to this theme because, you know, like I said, people, and I, I got tired of the discussion and the arguments with people, they always say they don't have any sternal wound complications. The closer you look at any study, at any pathology, any disruption of our outcomes, the closer you look, the more you find, right? When you really look for AFib, you find a lot of it. When you look for wound infections, you find them. So S there's SDS data, which is 30,000 feet, and there's more granular data that we achieve when we look at particular programs and programmatically look at the outcomes. So deep sternal wound infection rates, if you look at the studies that are out there, this study didn't turn out very, this, this slide didn't turn out very well, but our study landed right about in the middle of what the literature says for both deep sternal wound infections and for sternal complications overall. So here's the punchline, what does it cost? It costs whatever it costs to put plates in. I don't even know how much they cost. But the total index hospitalization, I guess we get an idea from here, uh, 23,437 versus 20,574. So you've got a higher uh, cost during the hospitalization, but after you burn through all those rehospitalizations and the, long, the longer stays in, in rehab, you end up with a cost savings that doesn't reach statistical significance. So it doesn't cost anything different. So I guess my point is that they're free. The plates are free because it, it's negative $1,646 for the patients who have plates. It doesn't reach statistical significance, so it didn't really happen but it also means that they're not different. So the cost was exactly the same for the two groups, only the people with plates had the advantage of having the plates. You do not know who benefits the most. People say, I do it for high-risk patients. You don't know who's gonna benefit. You're gonna have somebody who's gonna have a wound complication who has perfectly normal bone when you do them. And furthermore, what is the benefit? Is it going back to work sooner? Is it not having pain? Is it staying out of rehab? Is it being able to do things when you get home? Is it being able to pick up your kids early? Pick them up physically, I mean. So how do you qualify it as a benefit? And for us, it's been all comers. So for us, we have two grades of sternal precautions. I don't use red at all, as my PAs will tell you. My partners, when they have people with a BMI over 40, they will sometimes use red precaution. Uh, but green for us is basically, while they're in the hospital, we try not to get them to use one arm for anything lifting or push off with one arm. We get them, just train them to use both of their arms. But we let them get out of bed with their own arms. We let them sit up with their own arms. We let them get on and off the toilet with their own arms while they're in the hospital. So when they go home, they can do all this stuff. They can drive around in a car, they can walk around well, they can lift things when they're at home. The usual lifting that you do through your course of your normal day. And we liberalize it a little bit more based on who the patient is and how sturdy they are. And then we just kind of get them back in action. So when they come back to see our nurse practitioner at two weeks, if she looks at the sternum and everything looks good and the patient feels fine, we pretty much kind of cut them loose then at two weeks. But otherwise, it's pretty much at four weeks that we really cut them loose. We'll send people back to work earlier than we used to, though. And these are just some folks. You know, when you have people that do walk with a walker, you get them up right away using their walker, not hugging a pillow. Same thing here, big people who you do big operations on who can go home quickly, people with multiple problems and big operations that can go home quickly. This is a guy, this, kid, this guy's son sent me, I didn't know there was audio here, this guy's son sent me this video, he was uh, five and a half weeks out from surgery, he's an 82 year old guy who loves to bowl. So, you know, admittedly, that's, a, you know, that's an anecdote, but the point is that we, we enjoy this over and over again, so I think it's important that we recognize that it, maybe this thing that we've been doing the same way for 30 years could probably be done differently. That's it, thank you.